Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Sci-Files, an impact exposure series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudoum and Daniel Puentes. This summer, our theme is focusing on the relationship between graduate student mentors and their undergraduate student mentees. Mentoring is an important part of research and helps students develop into the scientists of today. Today, we welcome Taylor Murphy and Victor Gibson II. Taylor, may you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Taylor Murphy. I am a third year graduate student in the Genetics and Genomic Sciences graduate program here at MSU, and I'm in uh, Dr. Amy Ralston's lab. And Victor? So hey everybody, my name is Victor Gibson II. I am a rising junior cellular biology major from the University of Georgia. I am here this summer at Michigan State University through the Summer Research Opportunities Program, or SHROP program, and I do stem cell research in Dr. Amy Ralston's lab with Taylor. Nice. Can either of you tell us a little bit about your, what your research has been looking like over this past summer so far? Um, yeah, I guess I can start. So uh, what Victor and I have been working on, the big question is how do stem cells uh, develop just spontaneously? Um, so what that means is stem cells are uh, a cell type that can become any other cell type in the body. And um, we want to understand how they first develop in embryos because uh, that can teach us how we can create stem cells in the lab. And that will give us the opportunity to um, more effectively treat certain diseases. I don't know if you want anything to add to that. Yeah, so specifically this summer, I'm working with a certain type of stem cell called Zen cells. And basically, these are stem cells that are kind of produced when you are reprogramming somatic cells. So that's basically taking a cell that already has its fate determined and pushing it back to a state of pluripotency, which means that it can change into any cell type. Is there a particular reason why you're looking at Zen cells versus any other types of stem cells out there? Um. Yeah, so as I said, they're uh, produced through reprogramming. And so not a lot of people understand why reprogrammed cells take two paths. So when you reprogram a cell, you get these things that are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And that's um, about like, there's a one third ratio between the two. And so the other part of that is what we call induced Zen cells. And people are, are trying to figure out basically why some cells go to IPS cells and why others go to IZEN cells. May you please clarify what it means to reprogram a stem cell? So yeah, when we're reprogramming, we basically take a cell, as I said, that already has its cell fate determined, and we want to push it back to a state of pluripotency. So this is like taking a skin cell, which already is saying, okay, I'm already a skin cell, and taking it and kind of reversing it in a way to a point that's saying I can become any cell type again. Taylor, can you tell me a little bit about what pluripotent stem cells actually are? Yeah, so there is a spectrum of... Um, basically how many different cell types a stem cell can become. So uh, there's totipotent, and that can become any cell in uh, that you could imagine. So a placental cell, which is outside of the embryo, so it's not a body cell. It um, is, you know, what the uh, embryo lives off of. And then it can also become all body cells. Pluripotent is one step down from that. So that means that it can become any cell in the body, but it couldn't become like a placental cell because that's outside of the fetus. And then there are steps down from that. So like multipotent, for example, the Zen cells that Victor was talking about, those are multipotent stem cells. And so they can become a couple of different cell types, but not all of them. So basically those Zen cells can become a uh, yolk sac or visceral endoderm, which visceral endoderm is outside of the fetus and it signals for brain development when the fetus is developing inside the mom. Cool. So what particular area are you looking at with this? Uh, so basically the point of our research is to understand how we can better make stem cells ourselves. And so my work, which is a little bit uh, different than Victor's work, mine is uh, looking at how a certain uh, factor, which is called OCT4, 
uh, is able to induce uh, these pluripotent stem cells and multipotent stem cells. So it's the same factor at the same time, but it's able to push these cells down two different paths. And we want to know what um, is also involved because there there has to be another factor that it's partnering with or um, something to do with the DNA itself that is allowing this to happen. And uh, Victor can talk yeah. a little bit more about his. And so what I do is I work with these Zen cells. And so basically what I'm trying to do, the goal of my project is to take these Zen cells, which are multipotent, and reprogram them to see what they would be able to produce because no one has reprogrammed these types of Zen cells before. Are you using Oct4 to reprogram them? So in a way... Yes, technically, the reprogramming factors we use are OSKM, and OCT4 is the O part of it, so it's kind of kind of like an acronym, so OSKM is four different types of reprogramming factors, and OCT4 is the O part of that. Taylor, you introduced the concept of a factor. What, what is that, and why is that important for this kind of research? Yeah, so a factor is, in general, basically anything that can influence a cell. Um, in this case, the factors that we're talking about, uh, we mentioned OCT4 already, um, and the other three that we're using to pre reprogram are SOX2, uh, KLF4, and CMIC. Those are transcription factors, and what a transcription factor means is that um, these proteins are able to bind areas of the DNA and allow them to be made into other proteins. So they basically are an on switch for whatever cell type these are going to become. Um, so these four factors were found to be necessary for reprogramming. So getting a cell back to this pluripotent state um, by turning certain things on and allowing them to be uh, more fluid in their cellular identity. Cool. So what I'm gathering is that these factors are things that turn the cell on and off to turn them into specific cells. And you are particularly investigating it with OCT4. Am I right? Yes. And why are you particularly looking at OCT4? Um, so I'm looking at OCT4 because we know a lot about OCT4. Uh, so our lab previously were the ones that uh, found out that OCT4 can uh, lead pluripotent stem cells and multipotent stem cells to a certain fate uh, that wasn't previously known. OCT4 is usually, uh, previous to this, thought to be a pluripotency factor, which means that it is only useful for s uh, stem cells that are pluripotent. Um, but Lo and behold, it also can be used by multipotent stem cells. And um, yeah, so it's just, it's a really popular, important factor for uh, stem cell development. Is there a particular application for these Zen cells towards some sort of therapy that is currently in development right now? Um, no, not particularly because people have not necessarily investigated Zen cells too far yet. So like Taylor was saying, we know that they are multipotent, but as I said, no one has reprogrammed them yet. So no one exactly knows what they can become yet because there's a possibility that they can become pluripotent. That's a hypothesis, but that's not necessarily the case for sure yet. So there's not any medical or any biomedical applications with them currently. But if they could turn into pluripotent cells, it's possible that it could maybe solve a stem cell proliferation problem that scientists have an issue with? Yeah, exactly. I don't know if Taylor wanted to add anything else to that. Yeah, so um, basically we are looking to reprogram Zen cells because um, we want to understand if these cells have the ability to become pluripotent because they... Um, are kind of, you know, the step down on the ladder. They're multipotent, and we want to see if we can get them back up to pluripotent because when you're reprogramming, you get one-thirds pluripotent, and that's very low efficiency. And the other two-thirds are the multipotent uh, I-Zen cells, which are the induced Zen cells. 
And if we could understand what's keeping those uh, cells from becoming pluripotent, we could, you know, say add another factor and allow uh, close to 100% efficiency for making iPS cells. And then that would allow us to um, have more efficient uh, stem cell creation because right now uh, stem cell therapies are very limited. Uh, they're uh, a lot of stem cells are uh, derived from human embryonic um, human embryonic uh, cells, and that comes with a little bit of uh, ethical dilemma uh, with most people. So if we could kind of get rid of that ethical dilemma by taking cells directly from the patient um, with their consent, we could just take a skin cell and turn it into a pluripotent stem cell. And so, like Taylor was saying, there's a possibility that we could be able to push these multipotent cells, as she was saying, a step up to pluripotent. But what we, my current hypothesis for my project is saying that these multipotent cells, even when reprogrammed, will stay in a state of multipotency. So either path, uh, whatever the answer to that might be, will still teach us a lot of things, because then if they stay in a state of multipotency, that'll also give us a little bit more information about cell fate determination. Um, so, yeah, there's two different paths that it could go. It sounds like we're decades away still from rapid regeneration with stem cells, but still on the right track. Mm -hmm. Taylor, you had mentioned the ethical issues of stem cell therapy and stem cell research in general. I'm curious, what types of stem cells are you working with right now? And what is the reason on why you use one versus the other? Um, so, uh, we actually use mouse stem cells, and that's because, uh, you know, human stem cells are derived from fetal tissue, and that uh, goes against uh, a lot of people's ethics, uh, which is understandable, and also currently a lot of uh, more harsher policies and bans have been brought about for fetal tissue research. Um, so lucky for us, we can use mice and they have, uh, very similar embryos and, uh, very similar uterus, you know, the embryo still implants. And, uh, we know a lot about these factors in mice. So, uh, you know, it's very comparable to human beings, which, you know, gets rid of the ethical problems and allows us to still, uh, be able to use this research to help human beings. Yeah, and still make great scientific progress in the same time. Yeah. Do you think your research can eventually be translated that it can be applicable towards humans? Like, I'm assuming you can't just inject mouse stem cells into humans, can you? That's correct. Um, so you cannot just uh, take mouse cells and inject them into humans. They're... Uh, your immune system wouldn't like that. It would it would get angry with you. But um, so what we hope to be able to do is have a patient and they need a uh, stem cell therapy of some sort. Uh, we could take a skin cell and then be able to reprogram it into uh, whatever they needed. So if they um, needed more blood cells. Uh, so there are bone marrow transplants, which are done uh, a lot. Those are usually from donors. But if we could take a patient's own cell, we wouldn't have to worry about rejection of uh, this tissue. So we would just be able to take their skin cell and make it into more blood cells. Um, to do that, we need to be more efficient and we need to understand how to be more efficient, which is why we're doing the research that we're doing. It sounds like a skin graft, but with an extra cellular step. Yes, that is very correct. Hmm. Victor, this seems like an extremely difficult topic to get involved with, especially just for a summer. Have you had previous experience in this field before, or did you just jump right into it? So I personally have not had any experience with stem cells specifically until this summer. But last summer, I did some regeneration research at the University of North Florida where I was working on 
sea cucumbers as a model organism for regeneration. So I've had some lab experience, but a lot of the techniques that I've been able to learn this summer are a lot different from anything that I've been able to do so far. Did you say sea cucumbers? Yes, I did. Why were you looking at sea cucumbers? So sea cucumbers actually have a very robust regenerative ability in their um their neuro system basically. So there are these things in sea cucumbers called radial nerve cords, which in humans would mimic what our spinal cord would be. And so when these nerve cords get damaged in sea cucumbers, they're actually able to regenerate them completely. So we were basically studying how they're able to do that and we want to learn more. So maybe one day humans could possibly be capable of something similar. Maybe they make their own pluripotent stem cells inside of their spine. Who knows? Very possible. I, I see a connection, honestly. Very yeah. possible. I think of like regrowing limbs like with lizards. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's certainly one way to look yeah. at it. Well, that's cool. You had prior research experience before coming here. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that helped prepare you for the lab scenario over here? Or was it a different lab and different training and things like that? Um, so I would say that the training was definitely different here, but the ability to kind of take previous lab skills saying, you know, I've been in a lab before, I've had to learn techniques before definitely helped me coming in because I was very open to learn more techniques and add on to kind of what I had. So it wasn't as hard of a transition as I guess, you know, maybe if you haven't done it before, but it definitely helped me out having some prior lab experience. Great. And you had also mentioned that you were in shop. I, I Back in 2016, I was also a, a shopper as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what has that experience been like for you? So it has really been fantastic. I definitely think that coming here was probably the best choice that I could have done for myself this summer. So there was a lot of, obviously, research experience in the lab, learning a lot about stem cells, learning what they do in the lab, how they do what they do. But also, Shrop did a lot of professional development as far as preparing you for networking, preparing you for conferences, talking to people, keeping a network, but also how to apply to grad school. So they taught us a lot about the importance of having a professional degree, um, a grad degree, I guess, and how exactly to do that. So that was a big thing. And it was also cool to really just meet a lot of other interns around my age that are coming from all these different places, whether that's the West Coast, East, wherever, and everyone here comes here that and they all have a goal, right? So it's really cool to be able to just hang out with these kids that are also very motivated and everyone has their kind of goals set and everyone here is motivated to do hard work and that was a lot of fun, so. I would also argue that one thing that Shrop does a really great job at is bringing in students from all sorts of different topics as well. Right. Because it's not like your typical REU program where you have a single group of students in one area. Yeah. With Shrop, you have students all the way from the social sciences all the way up to math and the hard physical sciences. So, And everything in between there as well. I think that is something that MSU as a whole does as well with training their undergraduates that come here for the summer. You mentioned that they gave you professional development training, particularly towards getting into graduate school. Are you interested in graduate school, Victor? Absolutely. Yes, I'm definitely interested in eventually getting my PhD. And do you feel like your mentoring relationship with Taylor has helped you towards graduate school? Like, has she maybe helped prepare you for graduate school? 100%. Just from, obviously, her teaching me how to do lab things, but then also just having casual conversations about her experiences as a grad student and stuff. So that's given me a lot of perspective about, you know, maybe once I get to this point, how... It gives me an idea on how things might be, how my life might be, my schedule and stuff. So she's definitely been a big help. Taylor, what has been your experience having the opportunity to mentor an undergraduate student in your laboratory this summer? I think that it helped me in many ways. Um, so uh, Victor was is actually the first undergraduate student that I have mentored as a grad student. Um, so the ability... Uh, to learn how to explain things to him uh, helped me better understand my research. Uh, and also, I'm getting ready to take my comprehensive exam. And the, the questions that he was asking are probably things that I'm going to be asked uh, during my exam. So it was really good preparation for that. That's wonderful. Some of our listeners might not know what a comprehensive exam is. Do you mind explaining what that is in general terms? Because I know 
different programs have different requirements? Yeah, so a comprehensive exam is uh, basically uh, the gateway to becoming a PhD candidate. Uh, so right now I am a PhD student. And after my exam, which is going to be a presentation, and I have a written proposal that I write about my research, I then can earn candidacy, uh, which is going to be great. Well, good luck, Taylor. Thank you. It's certainly no easy journey. I'll be hopefully at that point in my life within a couple of weeks, so we'll see what happens. So then between mentoring an undergraduate student and getting ready to move into a PhD candidacy. Well, do you have time for anything else? Um, so on campus specifically, I am part of the genetic student organization. So I am our third year representative. I was our second year representative before I became a third year. And uh, our student organization is really focused on outreach in the community. So that's something that I love being a part of. Um, I've actually helped with Girls Math and Science Day here at MSU, um, uh, presenting a, you know, a little bit of what we do in my lab. And also, uh, I took part in uh, Science Day at one of the local elementary schools. And we taught kids how to extract DNA from strawberries and uh, gave them a little bit of an idea uh, what DNA is, how you extract it, and also just being able to talk to them about science. Uh, because that's uh, one of the most important things to me is making sure that people stay interested in science. Um, I think that... Uh, in my elementary school, we were very focused on science. I grew to love science because of science fairs and everything like that. And I just hope that I can, uh, you know, help other students stay interested in science. And I would argue that it is important because without engaging the public in science and making it accessible to them, then how are they ever going to be inspired to go into the field themselves? How are they going to ever discover that passion for science that they may or may not even know that they have when they're at that age. Yeah. So I thank you for doing those kinds of things. It's, it's really my pleasure. It makes me incredibly happy to do. I agree. Contradictory to your experience, I didn't have many science experiences in elementary school. Not many people came to us or did outreach and whatnot. And what I really admire about Lansing and East Lansing is that the university really tries to connect with the community. Students are always trying to get out there and actually interact. Like people can come on campus and get tours of facilities and be inspired and actually try to understand what's going on. And I believe that's really important, like how MSU has a science festival. I, I think everywhere should have that, honestly, or something where the public can actually interact with the science. So, yeah, um, kind of going off what Taylor says. So I'm also um, pretty involved back at my home institution. So in the past, I have served on the executive board for the Peach State LSAMP program, which essentially is a National Science Foundation funded program in which they help minorities get to or become interested in really graduate school. So I've served on that board. I've also served as the community service chair for the Black Male Leadership Society um, back at UGA as well, where we just go out in the community and we just try to go out and, you know, just serve people, just do whatever we can to help um, Athens, which is the college town that I live in. And then currently I serve as a Franklin College of Arts and Sciences student ambassador back at my home institution as well. So with that, that allows me to kind of get to where Taylor is in the sense that I get to go talk to high school students, prospective students that may want to come to the University of Georgia and tell them about science, how it's for everybody, and, you know, just being able to mentor people and tell people my experiences and serve as kind of that role model for them. So I've been getting some of those opportunities as well. That's, that's, that's really incredible. I think, in fact, in my opinion, there should be more of a systemic value put on having our students perform these sort of activities. In high school, they have students perform community service hours. I, if each degree program had some sort of uh, way that it could implement something like that into their program, I think it'd be more enriching not only for the student, but also help build the community as, as a whole as well.
Yeah, Danny, I agree with you because I know that there's, a, I think, the plant biology department on campus. They actually have some sort of requirement that for them to do outreach, which the students love doing. It's not like they're forced to do it. And they're very active across campus, which is how I actually know about them because I don't study plants. But I think that's amazing. And like extracting DNA from strawberries is actually a pretty simple thing to do that a, that a parent at home can just gather a few materials in their in their house with strawberries and just interact with their child. Those are a lot of great points that you brought up there, Chelsea. And it's really important to continue having this conversation. One thing that I would like to know a little more now is, Victor, you alluded a little bit that you have an interest in going to graduate school. Uh, can both you and Taylor expand upon your plans of what you would like to do whenever you do graduate, whether it's with your bachelor's, in your case, Victor, or with your PhD, Taylor? So, yeah, um, once I obtain my bachelor's, um, I want to go to grad school immediately and I will be on the Ph.D. path. Once that happens, however long that will take, I'm not sure yet. Um, but I would like to probably go into industry for a little bit after that and then possibly work a job for like the Department of Energy or the CDC. And then once, you know, I get kind of established with that, I would. I'm interested in scientific communication, whether that's a form of outreach, maybe just going to speak to people or whatever, but just being able to really use my science to communicate to the public the importance of it and what exactly we all can do with it. Um, and yeah, so when I get my PhD, my plan right now it could change, but I think uh, the thing that I most want to do is be a uh, professor at a primarily undergraduate institution. Uh, so I got my bachelor's from uh, one of those institutions, shout out to uh, EMU. And I would really like to be a professor where I could interact with uh, undergrads and teach them how to do research, kind of like what I've been doing with Victor this summer. So this was like a little taste of my future for myself. Um yeah, so I think that would be really fun. Huh. I think that Victor must have been a good researcher if you still want to keep going down that route. Definitely. Victor, my last question for you is, is there any experiences that you plan on bringing back home to UGA uh, as your internship comes to a close? Yeah, so definitely I want to get involved in a stem cell lab, hopefully back in my home institution. And I think coming with the experience that I've gotten here at uh, MSU is going to definitely make that process a little bit easier for me. And then also being able to go back and tell people at my school about my experience with Shrop and then hopefully, you know, getting some people interested in applying to come here for maybe next summer, whenever that time would come as well. Thank you so much, Victor. And thank you, Taylor, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. And remember, the truth is in the science. If you're a current or visiting undergraduate student that would like to be interviewed with your graduate student mentor, please reach out to us at scifiles at impact89fm.org. See you next week on The Sci-Files.